Again, go to our website at www.hiller.org and you can follow all the latest information on our reopening. And now, without any further ado, and I see we are recording so we can begin this uh, talk, let's discover the ins and outs of Aircraft Home Building 101 with Dr. Chinmay Patel. So I think I'm gonna start sharing my screen. Okay. So hopefully everyone should be able to see my screen now. Uh, yeah, we can see it. <clears throat> I'm gonna uh, welcome everyone. I am going to talk a little bit about the design process first and then about my aircraft. Uh, so uh, the first third or so of the le uh, this talk is gonna feel like a lecture, but please hang on. I have a bunch of pictures after that. So hopefully uh, we'll have something for everyone to be interested in. So uh, the first thing is me, myself, and my project. Uh, and for me, I got the bug first when I started building and flying control line models as a teen, and it's never really left me. So I got my bachelor's in aerospace engineering in India, and then came to Stanford for my graduate studies. Uh, my PhD thesis was on uh, extracting energy from random gusts of wind. So uh, some birds are able to do that and birds or small aircraft can even sustain flight just based on the energy in the gusts. Uh, so that was a fun project to work on. In that time, I also became a private pilot and on the right, you'll see three aircraft that I have uh, personally flown and tinkered with a lot. Uh, the first one is a Falcon UL ultralight uh, it's a canard ultralight single seat with a two-stroke engine. Uh, the second one is a 1947 uh, Cessna 140. And the third one is a composite experimental called the KISS TR1. Uh, the KISS in my book is one of the best U.S. home builds bang for buck. Uh, I call it the poor man's lancer. Um, and my day job has been uh, flight testing electrical vertical takeoff and landing aircraft for a living. And that's what I've been at for the last decade. So I have a decent mix of academic and practical skills and uh, I thought I'd put them to use. So uh, since about 2014, I have been um, designing and building a custom two seater of my own. Um, you could say, uh, you could ask why design an airplane uh, at all when I could buy one or build one from a kit. And there is absolutely no rational answer to this. Um, it is, uh, I'm not saving money. I'm not saving time. I'm not probably being safer either, but I am having fun and I'm learning along the way. So those two goals were good enough for me to start. And so far, uh, it's all about me, 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 but you have to realize that it is mentors who make all this possible and it is friends and family who pay a huge price when one of their loved ones is completely engulfed in aviation. So uh, the title of the slide is just a ruse to get eyebrows raised. So, uh, scroll too fast. Uh, it was actually a friend that I met at the Hiller Museum who was designing an airplane of his own. And um, he told me that, Chinmay, if you want to design uh, an airplane of your own, you have to think of design, build, and fly as three pillars. And you have to try to be equally good on in each one of them. So uh, I have to clarify that design for engineers is not just the aesthetics but it is also about uh, um, improving a design using formal mathematical principles, which is called as optimization. Um, so I see a lot of good design happening in academia. Uh, some of the professional engineers are able to design and build their products. And then people sometimes vastly underestimate the amount of effort it takes to develop good craftsmanship. So, that takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of elbow grease to get good at something. Um, and then I also run into uh, many home builders and pilots uh, 
who would benefit a great deal by some exposure to the fundamental mathematical and engineering principles behind um, some of the design aspects. And then there are a few design enthusiasts who dream about airplanes, but they, uh, they aren't able to bite and uh, start a project of their own because they are, I guess, rational and I'm not. So one of the things here is that we are all paid to be specialists in our fields. And as teams grow bigger and bigger, it becomes more and more important to view a design or a product from different perspectives so that your work can fit in better with the other team's works, work. And also you set the correct expectations amongst teams if they have a better perspective of what the other teams are doing. So in that sense, it's very important uh, in my mind for people to come closer towards the center of this uh, diagram here. And that doesn't, that isn't easy to do. And the only way to do that is to seek out mentors in the fields that are not your forte. And then you can learn from the mistakes they have made. And you'll also hopefully pay it forward by teaching other uh, folks along the way. So, um, my lecture continues, but I would like to give you an overview of the design and aircraft design process uh, uh, from a home builder perspective. So ideally you'd start from uh, with a purpose that you want to fulfill, something that scratches your itch. Uh, that should lead to a mission that the aircraft uh, should be able to accomplish. Um, that leads to a set of requirements and constraints that then flow down to functions and features of the aircraft. Uh, functions and features of the aircraft. Once you have the features, you are at a stage where you should be able to do some sizing. So um, that is how big the aircraft is, how big the wing is, how much it weighs, and uh, uh, what sort of engine would uh, make it fly. So at this stage, you are at a stage where you can brainstorm different configurations and shapes for the aircraft. That leads you to a candidate design for which you can calculate the performance. Now you compare that performance to the requirements that you started out with, and then you try to tweak the design by improving it uh, in various aspects and try to achieve at the best design. And the best is in quotes because you have to choose very wisely about what best means. And that's very, very dependent on the project. And I'll talk about my best for the, uh, in a subsequent slide. This formal process in a red loop is called the optimization loop in engineering. And you could be iterating in this loop for a handful of times all the way to tens of thousands of times to get uh, the best design. Once the best design is there, you can um, uh, conduct preliminary and detailed design and uh, start building a prototype. These blocks in green um, take a huge amount of uh, uh, skill and resources. Um, and so these take up a huge amount of uh, effort but you have to remember that it all starts with a decent design to begin with. Um, then I have the testing block in red because uh, testing, uh, flight testing is sensational and it has its own risks. But when you get to testing, you are uh, going to be exposed to another project level risk where um, testing is where you start to notice that the numbers you calculated don't match up to the real world performance. And so you have to really work on throughout this process to be able to reconcile those numbers during test. And that is a project level risk, which is very different from um, the flight test risk, which is very sensational. So if you're lucky at the end of it, you actually get to use your aircraft or product and um, in using that, you can continue to use it enough so that you can say that you have fulfilled this purpose. So uh, one thing to note here is that it's a long way from deciding a purpose to actually 
using the product to fulfill that purpose. And life changes during this cycle. Um, and so uh, even the best airplanes, like a, an A380, for example, the A380 design struggled with meeting its purpose because the hub and spoke methodology that it was designed to fulfill um, uh, is not as important now because point-to-point -point flying is more important these days. So that brings us to the first lesson of the day. Uh, many a times uh, designers only have a partial idea of the requirements, but they somehow just know what the airplane should look like. And so they start with a shape, uh, be it a flying wing or a sailplane or uh, a canard or twin boom configuration. They come up with a candidate design, do the analysis and start to build. And by now you should have realized that then more surprises are going to await the testing phase. And the other thing here is that it becomes very, very hard to then uh, make a coherent story of the blocks that were murky in the beginning. So lesson here is do yourself a favor and uh, make sure that you start from the purpose and not from the shape. The shape comes somewhere in the middle of this process and not at the beginning. Uh, so that brings us to my project. Um, the purpose of my project, and your project could be very different, but uh, I'm hoping this can serve as a template for your thoughts. Um, the purpose for my project is to uh, build an airplane for fun. It is uh, a design, build and fly exercise to apply what I learned in school and develop the tools and the skills that are needed as a good engineer and um, a good pilot as well. So you could say that I'm still seeking closure after my experience in grad school, but uh, I think it's a worthwhile exercise. Um, the mission is to carry two people for about 575 nautical miles with uh, some reserve. The requirements, I'd like to go fast, I'd like to land slow, um, I'd like to climb at a decent uh, rate. Um, I wanted to stick with a single engine and a fixed gear airplane for its simplicity and side-by-side -side seating and also make the airplane trailerable. Some other constraints I imposed were that I wanted to design the airplane such that it could be built without any female molds. It, sh it should be built in a one-car garage uh, for the most part have replaceable components so that I could um, remove a horizontal tail or a wing and try to make uh, redesign them and put them on the same airframe. Also wanted to be cheap enough not to ruin my life. And talking of ruining my life, I also wanted to want to finish the airplane before it finishes my marriage. So that is why I decided to be fairly conservative um, and realistic about what I could achieve. Um, so the objective here is not to make the fastest or the most efficient or the lightest airplane. The objective is to finish the project and learn from it. And hopefully my second project will be much more aggressive based on the experience I gained here. Um, but for now, the, it is hard enough to finish a project like this. So let's focus on that. Many of the features you'll see in um, my design here are removable outer wings. There are auto connect flaperons. So the flaps and ailerons are a single surface. There is no fuel in the wings. The canopy is a flat wrap canopy that does not require any heating of the plexiglass or a lixan. Um, you have a all flying horizontal tail with an anti-servo tab that should be uh, should allow me to tune the feel of the pitch axis. Uh, it has moldless composite construction with flat fuse large sides. I'm going to use uh, protruded carbon rods for spark caps, and it's a simple Hershey bar wing with a center stick and a tail dragger configuration. There's many of the features uh, are something that fits in my brain. It may not be a rational decision, but at least it seems to work with uh, make sense in the framework uh, as I'm thinking through this process. 
now is the time when we come to the shape of the aircraft. So overall, my aircraft uh, specs came out to be about uh, 1125 pounds max gross weight, about 580 pounds empty. So it's a small light aircraft, uh, about 100 to 125, uh, 120 horsepower engine with about 25 gallons of gas. Uh, the wing loading is somewhere around 16 to 18 pounds per square foot and a power loading of about nine to 11 pounds per square, per square foot. And you could decide all of this before you decide the shape of the aircraft, uh, at least to give you a feel for uh, what the aircraft is going to be like. Um, so in this case, my aircraft is certainly a higher wing loading than a typical Cessna 152. Uh, so mine is like a Vans RV10 wing loading, but it is still a much lower wing loading than a glass air or a Lance air. So airplanes similar to my design would be the Columban MC100 Bambi, the a European home built called the Penek Gazelle, and of course the KISS TR1. So part of the reason I'm flying the KISS is to learn how to fly this design when I complete it. You'll see in the top view of the picture uh, of the airplane that uh, the wing is composed of three sections. The center section stays attached to the fuselage and the outer panels plug into the uh, center section uh, with a wing joint. So this allows me to remove the panels and everything should fit in a trailer if I decide to put it in there. Um, the side view shows a, uh, the main gear that is attached to the wing. Um, and then the tail, um, a tail wheel is attached to the aft of the fuselage. And then there's a pretty 3D picture for visualization of the aircraft and deciding what the fuselage shape is going to look like. Um, that brings us to the aerodynamic design. So as I mentioned, one of the things that's uh, peculiar about this design is the sizing. Um, the wing came out to be about 24 feet in span, about 63 square feet of wing area and an aspect ratio of about nine. So a typical uh, home built, a two seat home built has about 100 square feet of wing area and an aspect ratio around five or six. So mine is definitely a tiny high aspect ratio wing. And this allows me to, uh, in this case, the less wing area allows me to reduce the wing weight and also, um, increase the cruise efficiency. Uh, but that's only if I'm able to get a decent high lift performance for landing slow enough. Um, I've decided to keep the tails um, um, a bit on the larger size. So I have a generous tail volume and also the tail arm is fairly um, as larger than some of the home builds that we find. Many of the home builds just have tails that are either too small or too close coupled. And so I'm going for um, a bit of a conservative approach here. The fuselage is cozy with about 40 inches uh, wide and about 17 feet long. Um, switching to the pictures here, you'll see a picture of a custom designed airfoil um, that is derived from the NACA 64 series. So. Um, this airfoil, uh, people like to plot the drag polars, but I also like to look at the uh, pressure distribution. So this shows the pressure distribution with a favorable gradient in pressure for about the first 40% of the airfoil. And then there is an adverse gradient um, after that, uh, which is also smooth. The area behind, area between these two curves is going to be the total lift generated by the airfoil. And so this is uh, an airfoil that's not very aggressive. Uh, the favorable gradient should help with laminar flow, but I also have evaluated it with roughness so that uh, it performs reasonably if laminar flow is not achieved. Uh, one of the things you'll notice here is that the pressure distribution curves look like they have been very deliberately uh, drawn like that with uh, this uh, the peak point at about 40 percent and in some this is for people who are um, into airfoil history um, 
NACA, the predecessor for NASA, came up with an inverse design methodology sometime around World War II so that you would not start with the shape of the airfoil, but you'd start with the shape of the pressure distribution and then you could compute what geometric shape gave you the pressure distribution you desired. So that fundamentally changed how airfoils were designed. Now, uh, looking at my airplane uh, further, uh, I do not count on laminar flow for the performance calculations. Uh, so my airplane ends up with uh, a flat plate area of about two square feet in cruise. That is uh, higher than the Lancers or Long Easies or Quickies, but um, this is, uh, I think is realistic because I have a full span flap around with a gap in the wing throughout its uh, span. The max LORD is about 14 to one, so it's typical of an air aircraft this size and shape. Um, estimating a cruise of about 145 knots at altitude, we'll see if I get close to that. The picture on the bottom right shows the typical wing airfoil with the flaps deflected 30 degrees. And I'm uh, expecting a CL max for the entire aircraft of about 1.9 with that flap deflection uh, because the flaps act as ailerons also. Uh, you cannot get much more flap deflection out of this contraption. So you lose some lift because the flaps cannot be deflected to 45 or 60 degrees. But on the other hand, you gain because um, the flaps uh, are throughout the entire span of the wing. Moving on to structural design. Uh, structural design was actually one of the hard things for me based on my educational background. The idea is that you start from the aerodynamic and other loads and then you think how the loads flow through the, through the structure and that gets you the bending and shear stresses so you can select the materials. Um, easier said than done. Um, my airplane is designed with about a plus 4.5 and minus 2.25 Gs uh, capability with a factor of safety of two because of the composite construction. In here, uh, Part 23 gives you a good design guideline for designing a structure, even for an experimental aircraft. And I strongly suggest using multiple methods so that you can uh, compare your numbers that you do by hand or a computer program to make sure that they make sense. Also suggest weighing parts at each stage so that you can know how your estimates are. Um, um, and then there are a lot of details about supplies and layups and fuselage and landing gear structural design that I'm just going to skip due to lack of time. But the lesson two here is performance is optional, structural integrity is mandatory. So you are better off designing, uh, being conservative on the structure side and then improving on it uh, later after you know that the aircraft is flyable and performs reasonably. Um, the top right is a typical cartoon of a typical wing section. So there is a beam-like spar and a blue foam core um, that defines the shape. The spar consists of carbon fiber spar caps that are separated by PVC foam. And the whole thing is wrapped in fiberglass for the shear layer. Uh, once the spar is glued to the blue foam core, um, everything is covered with a fiberglass skin to give it the uh, hardness that's required and the torsional uh, strength that is required. So on the bottom, you'll see the horizontal tail um, that has just been laid up. Uh, you'll see here that the spar is ever so slightly uh, thinner than the wing so that it does not protrude out of the wing surface. And then I can fill it with filler later to create a very smooth transition between the core and the spar. Um, incidentally, 90% um, of this layup was done by my wife because I was busy mi mixing epoxy and cutting the fiberglass. Uh, so it's good to have help, especially during the beginning stages of the project. So now we get into the pictures. Uh, 
my construction process actually started from um, by CNC cutting the foam cores. I was able to um, design the hot wire cut files myself so that I could cut the lightning holes. And I also have recesses where um, a number of uh, 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 glass layers overlap. Um, you'll see here on the picture in the left that uh, the cores have the holes in them. And these holes don't make a big difference in weight in the tails, but I, um, I worked on the tails first so that I could practice doing the same thing on the wing. Turns out that by the time I got to the wing course, I had concluded that the holes are not worth the trouble. So you'll see the wing cores on the right-hand picture. And uh, one good thing about uh, doing solid foam cores is that you can see the design take shape on day one and you can sit inside it and make airplane noises. So uh, gives a great boost here. My wife is just playing along to keep my excitement. The other thing I like is that my mom was able to take this picture. So the whole family was involved in uh, cheering me at least. Uh, building the spars. So that's one big element of the project. So the spars are built from uh, carbon fiber rods, and these rods are about the cross section of half a popsicle stick. So you have a center section where the spar caps uh, are not tapered much. So the center section spars are about the same size rods. Then the outer wing spars have a lot of taper because they are designed like a long beam. And so the root on the top side of the picture has a lot of rods, and then there are fewer and fewer rods as you get to the tip of the wing on the bottom side. So you can take those rods, these give excellent properties and they're easy to deal with. And then you glue them together with an adhesive. And the picture in the middle shows the rods being glued in a template for the center section. Now you repeat the process for everything and you end up with the spar caps for the center section. And these have the dihedral built in and then the tapered outer uh, wing panel spars, uh, spar caps. Um, what you can see here also is are the two plywood jigs. Those are the only jigs I used for the spars. So it's pretty easy to make them from scrap plywood and you don't have to spend a lot of time um, working on parts that don't fly. Uh, one caution for the uh, using these rods. These rods show excellent properties in lab results and um, they, they can take up to 250 KSI in compression and even more in tension. But if you design with those numbers, um, it, the spar caps become so thin that it becomes really hard to transfer the load to them. So I used 75 KSI for compression and 100 KSI for tension. And it is very conservative, but then it makes the interface between the spar caps and the rest of the wing much easier to handle. So now you take the spar caps and put them on either sides of the PVC foam. You measure everything with respect to the CNC cut foam core, and then you vacuum bag the spars. That's what we see on the left-hand side. The middle picture shows the right and left outer wing spars that are glassed on one side. So the bottom side of the spars is not glassed yet, but then the fiberglass um, encapsulates the carbon from all sides. And then the root has some taper to it so that I can insert it easily like a sailplane joint into the center section. The picture on the right shows the center section, uh, sorry, the outer panel root where uh, you can see the taper. So at this stage, you can flip the spar over and the foam is not covered on one side, so you can gouge it out and insert uh, hard points so that you can later drill holes for the connecting pins. So the middle picture shows the glue, glued hard points and the region between these hard points is in very high shear stress. So you need in my case, I needed about 16 layers of glass here to provide it the sheer um, strength that I would like. 
And in this area, it doesn't hurt to be a little bit more conservative than usual because this is a main structural connection. So uh, the picture on the right shows both the spars, uh, spar roots are done and the foam is still bare on one face of the spar and we'll get to that later. So now you can glue the uh, glassed surface of the spar uh, to the aft portion of the wing foam core. Uh, the spar is not yet complete, so it gets frustrating. And this was a good time to uh, carve the uh, wingtips, and I just did them by hand. These are similar to Cherokee wingtips, but uh, a little bit more generous leading edge radius to make sure that the flow doesn't separate. And it was actually quite a rele release to uh, sand these by hand because it, it makes you feel like a little kid sanding something. The nav lights will also go on these wingtips in the flat portions here. So at this stage, you can uh, cover the front side of the spar with the sheer layer of glass and make sure that the glass overlaps quite a bit with uh, the aft side of the core. So this overlap uh, here with the core bonds the spar completely to the core. And it also provides a good bond, uh, bonding area to the uh, skin of the wing. So in the picture on the left, you see that the front side of the core is ready to glue to the spar and the spar is complete at this stage. So then I was able to do the top skin, which is on the bottom side of the picture in the middle. And then um, after doing the top skin, you can gouge some foam out to put hard points for the hinges and then do the bottom skin. And at this stage, uh, I was proficient enough with the layups that this is about a nine feet by two feet layup, but I was able to do it solo at this stage. So um, it's helpful to start with smaller parts first so that you can afford to throw them away or you can afford to learn on them. Uh, the picture on the top right shows the flapper on mounts and you recall the picture in the aerodynamic slide that has the diagram for it. So this is how it's going to look like. For this particular case, I needed several parts that were identical. So I was able to uh, draw them in CNC and a colleague was kind enough to help uh, Waterjet cut the parts. So it saves a lot of trouble if you use technology in the right places. So now we come, um, it, this June, I was able to drag everything out and assemble um, all the parts in approximately the same locations in my driveway. And this is also when the neighbors realize how, how big a lunatic I am. Um, so you'll see the wings here, the tail and general look of the plane. The flaperons are not covered in this picture and the flaperons are as you see, are quite long in span and they are actuated from the root. So since I took this picture, I've been able to cover the top side of the flapper on with carbon fiber skin because they are actuated from the root. They need to be very stiff in torsion. So I needed to go with carbon fiber for that uh, part. Uh, and the center section of the wing here indicated by the oval is also not covered. And this center section is only going to be covered after the wings are mated with the fuselage. So, so that I can tinker with the spar connection as much as I want before I have to put the center section um, on. So this slide uh, kind of gives you an idea of how somebody can go from a simple line drawing to a 3D visualization to an actual part. And just going through this cycle, for me, it took about about four years. And um, there's a lot to learn in doing this because uh, you learn not just by failing, but uh, you also learn by uh, sort of uh, learning how to do the parts in the first place. So all good work must be inter interrupted by a program management meeting where we celebrate dubious milestones. So, in my case, I completed the conceptual design. Then I got married so that I could have a full-time helper. Then I got a house so that I could have a garage. 
Then I started build, building the flight flying surfaces and also managed to have a kid in all this. Um, and I bring this up because planning a build is hard. You have to visualize things before doing where to put the peel ply, what to cut first, what to measure first, and what to order first. Um, for example, when COVID struck, uh, I had a lot of acetone and isopropyl alcohol in my garage, so I was not worried about that and the toilet paper, but I was worried about getting epoxy at the right time. So I went into action and bought gallons of epoxy. Um, and then most of us encounter uh, Gantt charts at work that span many, many years. And um, that has some advantage, but for somebody doing a hobby project, I tend to think like a gnat. Uh, where I am not thinking about the big picture uh, on a daily basis. I am thinking about it once a month, but I'm thinking about the next three tasks on a daily basis. And that is actually what keeps me going. And I've found that uh, if I look at the bigger problems, it's uh, it feels very hard. But if I look at the smaller chunks, it feels like I could accomplish 15 minutes at a time. Uh, on a daily basis and at least move forward. And there are many, many weeks where I don't even get those 15 minutes to work on it. So outlook wise, maybe a fuselage and landing gear next year and integration in 2022, but by now you realize that I'm way in over my head uh, and we'll see how life uh, cooperates as I do this. So for the fuselage, uh, it is going to be built in to, and the, the bottom port uh, part, which is going to look like a, a boat and a top section. Um, the yellow uh, bulkheads in this uh, drawing show the um, bulkheads that I will use to define the shape of the fuselage. On the top right is a plywood fuselage of the Gazelle 2 aircraft, which is all, also home built. And Mine is going to look very similar with flat sides, but the only difference is that mine is going to be a PVC foam and fiberglass sandwich instead of plywood. And the picture on the bottom right shows uh, how nice you can make a, a plywood fuselage look with all the correct contouring. So I hope to achieve something half as good as that. Uh, about engines, uh, my first choice is actually a Suzuki automobile conversion. Uh, and I know many of you are cringing at this point. Um, and I'm very aware that I have an unproven airframe and I'm trying to uh, go with an unproven engine as well. So I am closely watching the aircraft that use this engine. And uh, uh, it's as a backup, I'm uh, I'm also designing compatibility with the Rotex 912 IS. Um, the Rotex is a good proven engine, but I'd have to sell my kidney on eBay to get it. So it doesn't align with the design philosophy uh, of my home built as much. Um, I'll be doing a ground adjustable prop first, but after that, I'll, I'd like to design a custom propeller. Uh, I'm not too worried about the panel at this stage because I need to prove the aircraft first. And like many designers, I haven't talked much about the landing gear, um, but the landing gear, I hope to, uh, it's going to be a steel, a concentric steel tube landing gear like the Mike Arnold AR5. Um, and that will attach to the center section as we saw in one of the pictures earlier. So, this brings us uh, to the lessons so far. Um, granted, I'm only about 15% done with the project yet. So these uh, lessons are preliminary, but I hope they will help you uh, learn about this. The first thing is that you have to find the right project for you. The purpose of the project strongly determines how motivated you are going to feel for the next five, six, seven years or more that it's going to take. And so uh, try to have a story that you can repeat in your mind and that makes sense to you. Uh, the exercise is well worth it even if I fail. So I would strongly suggest starting on something, build samples, build a part or two, 
and don't be afraid to build it twice because the point is to learn and you could fly existing airplanes if you are just interested in the flying. Um, unlike building from a kit, designing on your own, actually uh, you have something to do every single day. So even if you don't have the time to build or if you don't have the resources to build, you can rest assured that you have lots to read as you design the plane. For example, when my, so time is not an issue. When my wife was in labor, I had an aircraft design book in her hospital bag and she didn't pass out or anything, but otherwise you know that I would have gone straight for the book. Um, the other big lesson is not to fixate on your strengths as Professor Donald Knuth from Stanford Computer Science would put it, aim for a high minimum, not a high maximum. You need a minimum level of proficiency in all the disciplines so that you can build uh, an airplane that's going to work. So your aggressiveness should be based not on your best skill, but on your weakest skill. Um, so just try to level out the playing field for you as you hit all these problems uh, in your build. I try to focus on what gets airborne. So my shop and uh, tools are nothing special. And I don't even use fancy technologies like CAD or 3D printing or CNC cutting more than I have to. So I'm, I, I'm no stranger to these technologies, but I'm evaluating very critically whether uh, they help me move forward faster or not. Uh, I'm a big fan of doing calculations by multiple analysis methods. So you should be able to calculate everything on a piece of paper, then do it uh, on a spreadsheet or use a software and all the numbers should make sense um, to you. And they should also be comparable to some other aircraft that are similar. Uh, this helps you cross check your work. Uh, another lesson that I had learned is that the Rutan uh, method that I showed you for designing the wing it's not as easy as I thought. I'd made, I have made way more mistakes than I had envisioned. And I've had to do many parts twice to really be able to um, be confident that this is a good enough part. Um, working, in a, working in a one car garage, I realized that a second workbench would be a blessing. I have one workbench that tends to um, be unusable if I'm curing some part for two or three days. Uh, the other big thing to uh, mention is that you, you are going to need helpers. There's no way you can do a project like this alone. So you need helpers and mentors who, uh, who know how to work with you. And for me, I have to thank them a lot because I have friends who, are, who have offered to do layups from midnight to 2 a.m. if I have the energy to do them. And you don't find these friends often. And those people who give you feedback are going to be invaluable for such a project because as a designer, you are going to get into a rut where your ideas are going to take over your brain. So it needs somebody else to talk to you about the flaws in your ideas. And it also helps to be married in that respect. So uh, <clears throat> that brings us to the last slide. Here's a picture of me at six years. Uh, and clearly I haven't finished the wings of that airplane. Uh, and then the picture on the right is my son when he was six months old. So what I'm hoping is that when he grows up, um, he grows up knowing that we built an airplane in our garage and that he could build anything he wanted. And that I think is a purpose in itself. So. Uh, that brings us to the caveat that everything I have talked about is vaporware until this airplane is ready for a taxi test. So uh, we'll see what life has in store and we'll try to do our best um, and then we'll see where we get. So here's where I'm at and I'm, um, uh, I have my email address there just in case somebody is not able to ask their questions on, in the talk, but uh, now I'm open to questions. <coughs> Excellent, uh, Chinmay. It was uh, fascinating to hear uh, your trials and tribulations. Uh, those of you with questions, we do have a few that are queuing up in the chat. Go ahead and write your 
questions into the chat box. Again, use the Zoom controls at the bottom of the Zoom uh, window on your screen to bring up the icons at the bottom. You'll see the chat down there. Um, let's see here. Bert Rosen, uh, so I did comment that the wings were symmetrical. Are you planning on inverted flight? Uh, or is that, is that part of the design choice that you made? <laughs> Uh, the wings were, uh, they're not perfectly symmetrical. So the design CL is about 0.3. And so um, the airfoil is not a perfectly symmetrical airfoil. It does have some camber to it. And this is not designed for aerobatics. I'll, I, I'll be very lucky to just be flying cross country with this aircraft a few times. And uh, Bob <coughs> Kikendall uh, mentioned that or asked to what degree were you influenced by Jim Marsky on the SPAR design? Uh, so I think Jim Marsky's manual has been useful to me. And I think my construction method is not the same as his, um, but uh, Jim's work has given me some confidence in using the carbon rods. And uh, the same goes for Bob Kukendall as well, because I've repeatedly talked to them to get their feedback on how the rods work for them. <clears throat> Mike Singer has an interesting question. Um, how do you know that your design will fly and is stable? What would you do if it won't fly? Are you, are you basing it on truthing your calculations based on known aircraft types that you know will fly and that's where your confidence comes from? How do you know that it will fly? So two things. I know that it will fly uh, the first inkling comes with the sizing. I know that the wing and engine and the weight of the aircraft are in a, in a zone where it's going to be a reasonable build. So that's where uh, my first sign of confidence comes. And then um, there's a lot of calculation about stability of the aircraft, about the um, capability of the airfoil to generate lift, about uh, the interaction of the flaps and such that I haven't been able to talk here because uh, of lack of time. And just to keep the talk interesting for everyone in the crowd, but there's a lot that goes behind it. And the other thing that works for me is that uh, uh, the configuration is a very basic configuration. So there are many similar aircraft that have flown and that also gives me some confidence and some capability to look at the numbers for those aircraft. The other thing that helps is that I have been very fortunate to work with many test pilots and I, I may even get a gullible test pilot to help me test fly the aircraft. So um, it's a, when I get to flying, it's going to be a very uh, incremental approach. So you don't fly the aircraft on day one. I, I, it may take months of ground testing for me to be comfortable to hop in and actually fly. Good. Um, Douglas Palmer asked an interesting question about weight, and, and it occurred to me too when you talked about how you carved out all of the weight holes, saving holes, and then decided that you didn't need them. Uh, what What is the difference between what you are designing and calculating the weight to be with what the finished part is actually weighing? Uh, is there a big delta there? Uh, actually, uh, there isn't because uh, uh, let me look at my notes, but uh, it looks like uh, the horizontal tail um, uh, came out at about, uh, let me find them. I'll start with the wings. So the outer wing sections that you see in the pictures are about 36 pounds and the total wing weight I have uh, estimated is about uh, uh, 98 pounds for the both the wings. I think I'm going to bust that a little because uh, the wing joint is turning out to be heavier, but it's probably going to be within about 10% of my estimate. And that also um, brings me to when you're estimating these things, it's good to be conservative. And at, at that stage, you have to calculate how much area of fiberglass are you you're going to need how many layers and how much glue you are likely to use. So I have a lot of experience on my build capability based on my model airplane flying. So I've built many model airplanes to know how sloppy of a builder I am. And that's helping now. 
Is there any value to building scale models? I know there's an issue obviously with scaling weight versus volume and so forth, but is there any place where a model helps you in this in any way? Uh, I think so. Uh, so in this particular configuration, I uh, the configuration is simple enough that I am confident enough in my calculations that I wouldn't need a scale model. Uh, I've actually designed another single seater in the past, which I haven't started building yet, but that was a canard configuration. And in that I did up to four subscale models just to understand the configuration before I started building it full scale. Um, so there is definitely value to doing it. In this particular case, the aircraft seems simple enough based on my level of experience that I'm confident it will, it's a reasonable to build. I, I had a question and I hope it doesn't betray my lack of knowledge of how to build airplanes, but uh, all of this use of fiberglass and epoxy, I think of, you know, what going to the Marine store and just buying the, the stuff you slap on a boat or are, is there an aviation grade to fiberglass uh, epoxies and compounds that you're using? So uh, <laughs> I am using aviation grade stuff, uh, but people have used Marine grade uh, epoxy and fiberglass for their projects. I am I tend to stick with the aviation grade stuff because I get better properties, uh, better documentation for the properties, and that helps me fine tune my calculations a little bit. Yeah, that would be my question: is what would the difference between an, a marine grade epoxy be and an aviation grade epoxy? I mean, um, so just I the think stability, the co components, and their the way they age over time. Yeah, so the way they are exp uh, affected by UV rays, the um, in many a times it's the the way they sit in your shop over time, mm. because you may be doing a layup every two months as you keep working on the components. Uh, you have to make sure that the shelf life is good. You have to make sure that you get the properties right. You have to make sure that the epoxy doesn't need. Uh, elevated temperature cure if you're if you don't have the setup for it. And I guess I can ask one final question and then we'll wrap up and that is are you willing to forecast when the project will be done? <laughs> uh, I think it's going to be about 2023 if life cooperates um, but uh, that's a wild guess at this point. Um, I do want to make it uh, I actually want to finish it late enough that my son actually has an understanding of what we are about to do when I go for a first flight. So be there's some value to uh, imprinting that on him. <laughs> and I guess we did get one more question sneaked in. We should definitely address it uh, from Noam. And that is, did you have handling quality goals in mind? Oops, I just lost it when you design the plane and what level of analysis have you put into that handling qualities goals? <laughs> so uh, that is actually one of the weakest spots in my uh, design. So um, I haven't designed a, a mechanical control system myself yet. So this is going to be my first attempt at it. And I only have a conceptual um, design of the control system at this stage. Um, handling qualities calculation, I am still going by the dynamic qualities of the aircraft so that it has, it is going to have good stability margin, good static margin. It is going to have good lateral handling, handling qualities and you can figure out what modes the aircraft is going to um, uh, display as it gets perturbed. So at this stage, uh, that is all I have. One thing that I have tried is to, in designing the control system, I have tried to make it adjustable. So it's going to be pretty much like a model airplane where you can put a control rod in uh, a hole that is closer or further away from the hinge and tweak it a little bit. So that, but that is one of the harder things I will have to do. Well, it looks like you have some potential volunteers in the audience. So if you need some help, uh, you, you, you have to reach out and let them know. Uh, th thank you, Dr. Chinmai. Uh, your presentation is uh, interesting and it's inspiring. And it's great to know that people are still building airplanes in their garage. 
I was thinking maybe you had a hangar over at Half Moon Bay or something, but no, you're doing it in your garage, which is where great uh, vehicles and uh, brilliant designs should always be laid out. So uh, I wish you the best of luck in that. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody for joining us tonight for Dr. Patel's talk, and uh, I hope you join us two weeks from now for Dave Prakash and his talk about being a B-52 pilot and a flight surgeon in the Air Force. So in the meantime, uh, stay safe, keep tabs on what we're doing at Hiller.org, and we'll see you two weeks from today. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night.